experience involves risk. If somebody is in the process of gaining experience and something bad happens to them, say they're a trainee sawyer and get hit by a tree, people say, well, see, you got to have experience. That's what they were doing. This is the Wildfire Lessons podcast. Our goal is to promote learning by revealing the complexity and risk in the wildland fire environment. We share the lessons. The learning that follows is up to you. Hi, I'm Kelly Woods, director of the Wildland Fire Lessons Learned Center. On today's episode of the podcast, we will hear a conversation between Alex Victoria, our assistant center director, and Travis Dodson, our analyst. They're going to talk about a recent report we produced titled the Tree Felling Accident Analysis, and they'll discuss why we produced the report and what we found in the process. You can find this report on our website, wildfirelessons.net. Do a search for tree felling accident analysis. Let's listen to what they have to say. Sometimes the actual data might be different than our assumptions. So uh, what are you looking at there? So this is the 2004 to 2019 tree felling accident analysis. Why does this exist and why is it, why is that the title? It was a tasking from the group doing the serious accident investigation on the Brian Hughes fatality. Mm -hmm. From the Uh, Ferguson fire. Ferguson fire. Yeah. Brian was a captain on Arrowhead Hotshots. He died and he got hit by a tree that was being uh, felled. And, um, and anyway, in the process of them doing that SAI, they said, Hey, we should do an analysis of tree felling accidents over the years, you know, which is a common thing, not just with this, but I think in general, people go to a a serious accident investigation. And it's one of those frustrating things. It's just like, hey, this has happened before. And a lot of things like this have happened before. Why does it keep happening? The, The notion of the lessons learned center is that the lessons get collected and distributed and then learned. And so for a lot of people, that would mean that the bad things stop happening. Right. And if the bad things continue to happen, it's proof that the Lessons Learned Center doesn't work or that people don't learn or kids these days, yeah, all kinds of different things that people say. But it, it's around this notion of, hey, this happens a lot. We should look at all the times it happened, not just this one specific uh, instance. Mm-hmm. Which I think is, you know, is, is, is probably a good thing. That's that's one of the benefits that we don't realize of doing accident reports is not the report itself, but the ability to go back and look at a whole bunch of things. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that I didn't realize for a long time. I thought all the lessons were from the event, but it turns out a lot of times the lessons are from looking at a whole bunch of events. Right. An aggregate, a collective, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, this was tasked to the Lessons Learned Center, um, and that, that title came from the tasking, right? That was an analysis of tree felling accidents or something like that, because I'm sure we're saying it wrong. <laughs> right. Well, I've got it pulled up. Where'd it go here? So the, this is from the Corrective Action Plan is what it's called. Captain Brian Hughes Fatality Joint Corrective Action Plan. It's joint because this was an effort between the Forest Service on on whose land, managed land, the incident took place, and the National Park Service, uh, which is who uh, Brian worked for. The bit that's written in here in the Corrective Action Plan is pretty close to what you ended up doing. The bottom line is you took a look at incidents from 2004 to 2019, um, you know, felling incidents. Um, we start to have to parse things pretty quickly here, right? Yeah. With Be- what it is we're talking about. So what, what were we talking about here? Yeah, it was instances where somebody was falling a tree, right? It's not like I excluded all of the instances where people got hit by a tree that wasn't being cut on with a chainsaw, you know, it's just, which is 50% of our tree strikes are uh, random trees falling, you know? Right. Uh, and that, that, that 50% is, um, it fluctuates, it goes 49, 51, 50, 50 through, and, and I'm saying that based on the years that I have done, looked specifically at that. The tasking was look at where they're actually falling the tree. Um, so, so somebody was cutting on a tree. It doesn't mean that the Sawyers get hit, right? Somebody got hit by a tree that somebody was falling. <laughs> 
right um or in the process and it's very specific is like you know including sizing up the tree but not tree accidents where they're bucking the tree mm-hmm. so the, all the bucking accidents were were not included all the hit by tree where they weren't falling the tree was excluded and so you did it you launched into it yeah and just the nature of this work is you get in there and, it, and it, the tasking was really so focused on recommendations hey are we recommending things that haven't been done have we um are they just not completed yet and see if there's redundancy, all that stuff in it. And and you get into it. And what I ended up focusing on was just operations, similarities and stuff like that. Things that happen, not what the report concluded. Sure. You know, partly because that stuff's easier to quantify, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, like it's easy to count. How many times did people get hit on the head? Right. You know, a helmet strike. Right. And that's something that is easily countable. Mm-hmm. Um, it says in here somewhere how many reports. Yeah, 53. 53 incidents. And it was, it was super daunting. Um, and I was glad when I got it down to 53. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. 53 is still, still a lot. And what are we, uh, what were you able to sort of um, conclude is a strong word. But <laughs> what, what do you think you uncovered or um, teased out of these 53 reports. I, I know there were a few things that kind of jumped out to me, but what jumps out to you? Um, so there is actually a little thing called key themes um, separated into three boxes. The first one is the tree, um, which is uh, the tree falling as it was intended. You know, the alternative being the tree went the wrong way and then um, predicting tree reactions and and then hung up trees so those are the things about the tree and then there's hazard and risk mitigation and kind of uh, the things that go along with that and then training lots of talk about training and accidents occurring during training because felling is one of those things that you know most people will agree oh it's it's all about trigger time you know time on task it's and, super important it's how we do it that's how we learn and train and grow and there's risk involved in that just like there is with any operation and so some people it's just a funny thing that we love to point out which is well people don't have experience people you know it's a common thing we say oh they need more experience guess what experience involves risk if somebody is in the process of gaining experience and something bad happens to them say they're a trainee sawyer and get hit by a tree people say well see you got to have experience they were getting the experience when they got hit by the tree right um and so it's kind of funny to me to point back at it and go it's just they don't they don't know what they're doing because they need to cut more right they were cutting when they got hit right (laughs) so (laughs) uh yeah anyway and and but it is this thing of like okay if uh if accidents do occur during chainsaw training what what are some things that we can you know, it's just kind of uh, opening our eyes a little bit. Anyway, the first thing in there, the thing that did stand out to me was, did the tree fall as intended? Now, think about it. We're talking about people getting hit by trees. The thing that comes immediately to my mind is, oh, they botched the cut and it went the wrong way. That's why they got hit. That's a, And that does happen. But of these incidents, um, 53% of the time, the tree fell the intended direction so i don't know if that's eye-opening or not to me i was i had to think about it and i counted over and over again i was like wait a minute (laughs) um carry the one right yeah do do the math again (laughs) yeah and and then there was you know as you start to break it down it, it starts to make uh more more sense um the times that the tree goes the way that we want it to and people get hit um is if the tree goes the way you want it to and it gets hung up Right. It still went the way you want it to. It just didn't make it all the way through mm. the canopy. Right. Okay. Uh, and so now you're dealing with a hung up tree that's covered uh, in another bullet. But it's just which, you know, we can argue it, that, well, that's a completely different falling scenario. Right. Which is true from a complexity and all that stuff. But we all know that when you're the person that just fell the tree that's hung up now, like you just want to get it on the ground. Right. Um, and of course that, that, that gets into all other things. So anyway, tree going as intended by getting hung up. Um, and then the other thing is the tree went the exact direction that it was intended to. It's just that it smacked somebody that was in the fall area. 
right other workers swampers usually mm -hmm. um or somebody like randomly walking down the fire line or something like that um you know control your fall area that's what uh, almost all of those reports say well you know they just didn't control the fall area mm -hmm. and then another kind of bullet is the tree goes the direction it's intended to but portions of it fall the top breaks out and goes a different direction or a limb falls out or um stuff like that and then there's this other really random weird thing is the tree that they were falling goes right where they intended it to it causes a separate tree to fall mm -hmm. and in a couple instances just a big tree hitting the ground caused other snags to fall mm -hmm. it's usually snags and then they're, they're standing at the, at the stump looking at this you know hey wow we really nailed that you know hit the pop can and then some random tree falls from behind them and i mean that's weird but it, it happens it's happened more than once mm -hmm. <laughs> i guess it's the only way to say that sure so yeah i know i don't know what that means i don't know does that mean anything to you that 53 percent of the time the tree goes the intended direction <laughs> well this is the first section of the report and i think it it kind of did jump out at me because i think like you i have this of this mental picture in my mind of if there's an incident somebody gets hurt somebody gets killed in a falling operation that is maybe the first place to go as well she didn't follow the direction that uh, it was intended to so i i felt like yeah there were going to be some numbers but for the number to be that high that was surprising to me yeah you know so um, and and I think the what it called into question for me was okay if what we're saying is we need to make better directional fallers as a solution for people getting hit by trees I, that doesn't really add up because mm -hmm. they're going the direction that we want more than half the time mm -hmm. and the other interesting piece of this is that the fall the trees falling in an unexpected direction only accounted for 30 percent so 30 percent of the time is that is is it a, an issue of the tree going in unexpected direction you know the other um the other 17 percent that's left was the limbs are top falling out during size up which is real, real it's a real deal kills yep. people yep um and uh or during cutting before the the tree actually falls mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and that's you know 17 percent is a lot right so anyway it's it to me it calls into question the notion that well we need to train sawyers better at directional falling mm -hmm. do we sure um i think it's always good to get a lot of training and stuff like that but i don't know that that's it's not it wasn't clear cut like oh yeah uh you know, 80% of the time it's because the tree went the wrong way and people were scrambling at the base of the tree. Just not the case in these ones. Mm -hmm. And I think as you walk through it in the perspective of someone who has, you know, cut trees, if you put yourself at the base of a tree and you walk, walk that out, it, it, it kind of makes sense. Oh yeah. Okay. When, when the trees hung up and that, that would make sense or the tree hits somebody else or a portion of the tree, you know what I mean? Like all those things make sense. It's just, I didn't realize it was that often. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. That was, that was the first one. The predicting tree reactions is kind of a piggyback onto the, the trees getting hung up, right? As you look at it and you go, oh yeah, this thing is heavy and I'm, I'm certain it can, it'll just go right through that canopy and it doesn't. And I just like, who hasn't had that happen? You know, in my mind, what's the bias for this? I'd come up with this ideal scenario, right? Right. And in my mind, it goes, it cleanly goes right through the the canopy of those trees right and and that's what i'm picturing mm -hmm. so and and i make all my cuts and all that stuff and it turns out there's not enough momentum or the tree's not as heavy or whatever and it's like really that little twig is holding it up i can't i just can't but then again there you are <laughs> right yeah i think of aspen snags when i when you're you're walking us through this and i that's what I think of is these, yeah, it'll get through, but yeah, there's this one little branch or the, mm -hmm. the mixed con canopy is just a little too thick or whatever. And it just, you can't drive through, um, yeah, make it to the ground. So, so there's that it getting hung up. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also the tree staying together, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes it hits those branches and the top breaks and comes back. Right. Now that's scary. Right. And trees being felled 
come into contact with other trees as they fall. That's a, a common thing, right? Then that's the 28% of all of them, the tree impacted on another tree during its fall. Mm-hmm. Um, 19% of the total, when that, you know, 19%, the top comes back. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like, wow, that's, that's a big deal. And of course, that was two, two of eight fatalities. So in all of these reports, there was eight fatality instances. And so I, I, I make notes when it's like, yeah, uh, the top breaking out and come back was, was uh, involved in two of the eight fatalities. And this is where I did look into the recommendations. 20 per, 21% of, of the reports that had recommendations uh, included uh, recommendations about enhancing training related to tree conditions. And a lot of that has to do with you know, the trees breaking, you know, that unexpected reaction, whether it's root pull or, um, a tree breaking halfway up or, um, you know, those types of things. A lot of the, the people doing the reports attributed that to species specific tree condition knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, it's just like we, we treat a lot of fire, I think in general, at least for me in my experience, maybe it's just a, I'm just a product of, of where I came from, but I just think of fire in terms of ponderosa pine, you know, and, and even in, uh, fire ecology related stuff, oh, we need healthy fire in a, uh, and I think of a short return interval. And part of that is because that the research, it's convenient to do fire related research in a short fire return interval like ponderosa pine, right? You can, you can do that stuff. You can't, it's harder to research, um, stand replacement fire (laughs) regimes that have a hundred or whatever. So anyway, then that, that general science, because it's available, gets applied to all kinds of stuff, right? Appropriate or not. Yeah. Yeah, And uh, (laughs) not in a lot of cases. And I think that's the same thing with, with tree cutting is that a lot of our pictures come in our mind, come from cutting straight, straight up and down trees. You know, a lot of pondo, a lot of just like timber type trees. Right. Uh, that's what we picture and that's what we get practice on. Mm-hmm. And now you're cutting an oak that's crazy heavy and doesn't grow straight. Right. You know, and uh, and uh, you can't help but use the slides that you gained in your experience, which is with a different kind of tree. Um, so I don't know. That was another thing that was of note, I think. Um, hung up trees was a whole separate category um of the times that people get hit 19 percent, they were 19 percent of the time they're working on a hung up tree whether the tree was hung up during the falling operation or it was already hung up they just walked up to it and it was it was there mm-hmm. um and i think that's understandable you know um hung up trees are complex mm-hmm. um and i think there's an extra la- layer of complexity when you're the person that hung it up mm. from my personal experience. Right. Talk about that a little bit. I just, I don't like it. I don't, I want the tree on the ground. Right. And why do you want the tree on the ground? Simple question. Yeah. Right? Why? <laughs> exactly. Cause that was my <laughs> job. That was the, you know, what I intended to do was I've never, I've never been in a situation where I was intentionally trying to hang a tree up. Probably just means that I haven't cut that much, but mm-hmm. Usually you want it on the ground. Right. Um, and usually if it gets hung up, it didn't go the way you planned. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's all this identity stuff about, you know, you're responsible for it and you don't, you don't quit until it's on the ground and, uh, you don't walk away from a tree. You know, it's all this, it's evidence of being a bad Sawyer. If you can't correct your mistake, mm-hmm. cause it is a mistake. It's not intentional. You know, and so for me, my reaction to that is I'm just, I, it, it feels more urgent. Mm-hmm. And I would prefer that other people don't see that I'm doing that. So mm-hmm. now I want to work faster, you mm-hmm. know. And mm-hmm. of course, this is all me saying it from my young 20s self, right? Uh, right. Where theoretically I'm a little more susceptible to that stuff. I know mm-hmm. there's superheroes out there that don't care about what anybody else thinks, <laughs> right? About them. Yeah. Right. 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 And they, I, I have run into people that are like that, but they're weird. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not all that common. Yeah. 
but for, yeah, for better or worse. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's that, it's that, and and you know, people talk about that, like, oh, the measure of a good faller or a good sawyer is, is they don't hesitate to walk away and all that stuff. But walking away from a tree you just hung up, you know. And I remember I, I wrote a, a a blog article where I, it, the title of it is "If you hang it up, hand over the saw," and just float this idea that if you hang a tree up, just give the saw to somebody else. Right. They're still going to get the tree on the ground, but it's just let somebody else do it. Right. And there was a bunch of people that just like, you know, said I was a clown. Right. Because uh, you should be able to finish the job. Right? right. But the whole point is just let somebody else that doesn't have the emotional investment make a clean new size up of right. the complexity that's involved. Because it's a completely different scenario at that point. Right. It's, And I think... I think in the blog post you you uh, made this comparison. We actually have formalized this in other aspects of our work. <laughs> yeah, you know, the burn boss, right? Like everybody, I don't know if everybody does it because I know that. Well, I know that's not the case. Not everybody does it, but it is a common practice when you're briefing before the burn, and you say, "Okay, if this thing goes over the hill, I am gonna not be the burn boss anymore, even if it hasn't uh, transitioned." to uh, an escape prescribed fire, just even chasing it, I'm going to hand over and you pre-designate and say, okay, I'm Travis, I'm the burn boss, blah, 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 blah. If this thing goes over the hill and we're chasing it and we're kind of in suppression mode, Alex here is going to be the IC. Um, and especially if we transition to a, a suppression fire. Right. We know, convert the fire. Convert yeah. it. Um, right. So-and-so is going to be the IC, even though I'm qualified. Right. Why is that? Right. Emotional investment, because mm -hmm. it is likely that I'm going to bust my ass and do things that I wouldn't normally do and theoretically take on more exposure or ask people to take on more exposure to catch that fire. Right. Because of the emotional investment. Right. Which makes perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. And so how is it different with a tree? A hung up tree is the same scenario. Right. Except for all those superheroes that can control their emotions and, you know, everything is logic and they don't actually, they're not affected by this stuff because they're superhuman. Right. And happen to also be really good followers too, right? Yeah. 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 That's, that'd be an interesting Venn diagram, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then we could throw in their, their style of commenting on Facebook. <laughs> See what overlaps there. Right. Yeah. What, where's the overlap? Yeah. No. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, in, in the ones that I looked at, at least not in the reports, nobody was trying anything crazy in terms of getting the hung up tree out. Pretty much people were just doing what we all do. To me, it's just so funny when I and I've seen people. I've, I've done it plenty of times and I have since seen a lot of people is that almost without thought, like it gets and they go, shit. And then they go up there and just start, you know, and it's just, you know, almost hardly even looking at it. It's just like, you just keep, that's just what you do when a tree's hung up. You just start cutting things off the end until it falls out. Stepping it down. Yep. All sorts of other creative, <laughs> colorful descriptors of that activity. Yeah. But yeah, stepping it down is just, you, you go and cut on it. And we've all seen where it just ends up straight up and down. And then you're like, oh, oh. now what? Yeah. And it's only at that point that we're just like, hey, do you got any uh, P cord and some carabiners? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or really taking a look at another tree to ping pong it over and yeah. down or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't think that's surprising. Um, but one of the quotes from one of the reports is, you can't leave a tree alone once you've put a saw in it, unless you're, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember I walked up, I, I, I came into a fire and we were relieving a crew and we met that crew coming out mm -hmm. and I'd already kind of had beef with that crew in the past and we walk up and we find a tree that has a face cut in it. Yeah. I'm literally like 22 years old and I just, ah, who leaves a face cut in a tree? And Yeah. It is a crazy thing to see. You're walking and especially if they're not even, I think I've seen both trees with face cuts where they you know, there's no back cut, face cuts in, and the tree's been flagged, hazard tree flagging, you know, and again, there's a judgment you can provide there. Then there's other times where it's like, there's not even enough, this has not even been identified. Oh, there was no flagging. I was just walking around <laughs> like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to go look for hazard trees before we jump in and start working on this thing. Yeah. And I'm walking around looking for hazard trees. Oh, there's one. Right. It's got a face cut in it. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's not a... It's true. You can't leave a tree alone once you put a saw in it culturally. Right. 
I mean, but you, there is ways, like you said, you can flag it, you can all these things, um, and talk about it and, and make an analysis because walking away from a tree is an option at any point. Right. And there's just consequences to that. Right. And usually the consequence is, Hey, you don't go over there. Right. Uh, rather inconvenient. I would, I would say sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't, yeah, I don't know what else to say about hung up trees is they're scary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that emotional investment thing is a real deal. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I know that there's, there's a whole school of thought out there that I don't know if the school of thought is that there isn't like, if you're a really good Sawyer, then you just won't have the emotional investment. Or that a really good Sawyer understands that and is able to somehow compensate and still make rational, professional decisions, even though the emotional investment is there. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and it's like, well, why bother with it? Just give it to somebody else that's qualified. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're so superhuman and badass and you don't care about what people think, just give the saw to somebody else. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it works that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. When people get hit, they get hit on the head 51% of the time. That's a direct helmet strike, which is crazy. Well, maybe it's not that crazy because I'm just thinking like the head isn't that much of your body. Right. Um, but yeah, we get hit on on the helmet, which I, th- I think points at a whole, whole bunch of things. Is that helmets are crazy important and, you know, you can extrapolate from there. Like, you know, are we wearing the best thing? And we did a whole issue of two more chains about that. Um, and it's complex. Mm-hmm. That's crazy complex. And this is, uh, this helmet section is kind of the first, first bit of the second key theme, which is the, the mitigation, the hazard yeah, risk mitigation. Hazard kinda, and yeah. Risk mitigation. Um, and a quarter of the reports did make recommendations about, Hey, we should research helmets. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's one of the pieces of PPE that hasn't changed in a while. Right. Um, and especially with, you know, the NFL and the concussions and, you know, the, the types of snowboard and ski helmets that people are rocking now and hockey and, you know what I mean? Like there's all kinds of, um, different stuff out there. Right. Um, and jump helmets, you look at smoke jumper helmets and, and, their the way that they've changed over the years like i mean even in the past 10 years right they've upgraded and and so i think it it legitimately begs the question and it's also it's possible we are wearing the best for us Mm -hmm. but i think there's a lot of people that think we should do some more work on that right this next one is a big deal not that it the rest of the stuff isn't a big deal but this next question about how many people oh yeah at the base how many people under the tree and uh I think, I mean, this this whole world, this whole conversation uh, elicits strong opinions. For and sure. there are people who will tell you that absolutely the right answer to this question is. But what do your numbers, what do your numbers reveal about how many people, um, at least in these incidents, were, uh, were at the tree? Um, so 42% of the time the person struck was not cutting. Now, the immediate reaction to that is... Yeah, well, why are we exposing more people to risk if if that often it's not actually the cutter? You would you would think, oh, we could reduce all these instances, you know, people getting hit by just not having that many people. But it's not always the person standing next to you that's going to tap your shoulder that gets hit. Sure. Only 10 instances was the, the person struck that wasn't cutting at the base of the tree, either a trainer or a swamper or whatever the current term is for the person that hangs out with the Sawyer, but's not cutting. <laughs> <laughs> I always called it a swamper. And then o- almost as many, eight instances where somebody was uh, struck in the work area, but they weren't involved with the felling operation. And then the other one is just you, nobody was cutting because they were doing size up mm-hmm. and something fell out of the tree. Yeah. The whole, the whole thing about having somebody at the base of the tree is because so many of us learned that way having two people there and this idea that they're going to tap you on the shoulder their job is you know a whole bunch of things but one of them being look up and they're going to tap you or physically pull you away which like literally has happened to me somebody matt pacheco pulled me away from the tree thanks matt yeah appreciate that um, that was a big branch. And so, and I think other people have that slide. And so 
they're pretty beholden to that. And then there's a whole group of people that teach that. No, the way to cut is one person at the base. Right. And it and just from a real common sense type approach, it makes sense that like, yeah, that's just one less person exposed. Uh, and, you know, it's never cut and dry like that, because if, if you were to take that 42 percent would drop dramatically if I didn't include those um, 12 instances where it wasn't a person at the base of the tree. Right. You OK. Know, um, that's just 10 of 53. Mm -hmm. The safe distance compliance, <laughs> you know, that's just like. You know, a lot of those reports were like, the two and a half tree lengths, we just got to stick to it. And and yet that just, it doesn't work. Hmm. I'm not saying that it doesn't work as in you're still going to get hit by a tree if you're two and a half trees away. I'm just saying we cannot keep ourselves two and a half <laughs> tree lengths away. Mm -hmm. as, to me, it's a very efficiency thoroughness type thing. It is very inefficient to stay two and a half tree lengths away when you're prepping a road. Right. Right. Like, really? Right. Two and a half tree lengths away of everybody that's cutting. And I know it's possible. It's just, uh, it's, it's slower. Right. Um, you know, and, and, in those instances it is sometimes the tree goes the wrong way, you know, cause that's, I'm usually comfortable. I, I can look and I go, oh yeah, it looks like they're going to take the tree that way. So I can be over here back behind them, you know, cleaning stuff up and, and, uh, and I'm not that concerned about it. Of course, if the tree goes the wrong way, then I'm then I'm scrambling, which it does happen, but not as often as the tree actually went as intended, and it still hits somebody overhead <laughs> 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 who, who ignores <laughs> stuff overhead. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think to me the biggest one that was really challenging uh, the the status quo is um, talking about escape routes, the 45 degree angles, right. So 40% of the time, the person struck was in the traditional escape route, meaning mm. the 45, mm -hmm. including five of the eight fatalities. And I've heard this in, in discussion for, for quite a while prior to, to me seeing these number. Um, and it's, it's usually those instances where the tree doesn't go the direction that they planned, yet you know, that moment where you see like, oh, the tree's going, you've already planned where you're going to go. And we've, we report this all the time about when you talk about something and you train for it, it just, it, it gets to the point where it's more like muscle memory and you're just doing what you're supposed to do. It's not a thought. We don't train people typically to look up and decide where you're going to go. You know, say, hey, you swamp the area and you clear your escape routes. And when they say clear your escape routes, it's 45s off the back. And you just, I, I picture it in my mind. I'm going to go down that way. And then the tree starts to go and you use your escape route. And in multiple instances, the tree fell that way. Right. Because they just didn't, it, for whatever reason, even if it's because they went through all their holding wood, doesn't matter. They used their escape route and got nailed. And so I think some people are saying, wait a minute. Why are we designing escape routes for when everything goes as planned? Because when you need them the most is when it's not going the way that you expect it. And I don't know the way around that other than what some of these reports very specifically recommend is don't just haul ass out of there. Look and make an informed decision, you know, and I know that people will say, oh, yeah, we used to say face the danger, right? Like you, you look at it and you make a decision before you before you go. But I mean, our training is pretty saturated with the 45 degree escape route. I mean, not that I've taken S212 recently, but, <laughs> and, and I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe we are training differently now. I think that that is a conversation I anticipate being had more and more. I think that th these are some of those types of ideas. Rote memorization is not always the answer. There is a dark side to muscle memory, and that's true of all kinds of different things. Um, it's the whole idea of mindfulness, um, not that they're mutually exclusive, but, um, the, the, the idea of, you know, you want to train, 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 train. So you're not thinking, you know, I, I know that like being able to deploy a hose lay or some of those types of things that should be quick and fast and efficient. And, um, you know, that like, I want the training and I want to to be able to, you know, you got to be able to do this stuff in your sleep. Cutting away a main parachute. You know, that's not an analytical. I mean, there is some analysis, but the time wedge is so compressed that 
you know, and that's again the reason why you're, we train the way you're describing here is that it's uh, it's a uh, uh, we try to automate some of these things uh, because the time wedge is you absolutely know, zero you know, and seconds. And but just because that works in some that is right, it doesn't mean that that's true for everything. Sure, because there's you know there's people that would have us automate everything. Right. Yeah. You know, and just have playbooks. Right. There's plays, scripts, checklists, yeah, yeah. all of that stuff, mm -hmm. and we need that stuff. And there's times where it you know the the whole idea of situation awareness is a constant reevaluation. You know, some people would make the argument that situation awareness is mindfulness. But that it's just being here now and like constantly taking stock of it. And that, you know, the situation awareness uh, tint, I guess, to this escape routes thing would, would be that, no, you, you make a decision, an informed decision about how you're going to escape that tree based on what is happening. The trees go in the direction that you thought. Yeah, makes perfect sense to go 45. Um, but it, then again, like this, we're talking split seconds. You know, there's times where you don't you don't have time to make that call, and that's why a lot of people say, "No, you just do whatever you can to just get away from that tree," in a pre-planned direction. It's right. just a calculated risk. Right. We had an RLS a couple of years ago that it, that was one of the the main focuses was. Do you look up or get gone? Mm -hmm. And uh, because it was an instance where the top of the tree came back and the the person got nailed as they were, um, they, they, they took a look up. They could tell that something didn't, you know, they wanted to make an informed decision and then they got smacked. And, the, and their lesson was, I should have just run like hell and got as far away from that thing as I possibly could. I don't know. That's a tough one. Right. Um, and I don't know if counting that stuff helps inform uh operators or not right or or training <laughs> <laughs> um improving risk assessment that was uh, almost 80 percent, 79 percent of the reports recommended improving risk assessment um and i think that's just an easy thing to say after something bad happens right yeah of course but i think specific to tree falling um, so a lot of that comes from the hung up trees and, and, you know, that prediction, you, this is what I think is going to happen versus what actually, uh, occurs, you know, the, the, the stuff about so much of our training just talks about falling operations as if a tree is a tree is a tree. Um, and so a lot of the reports talk about that, uh, consider the species of tree and the size up process and how the species will potentially affect the falling. You know what I mean? And it's just, that's so daunting to me. Really? We're going to teach people all the different trees and all the different things that can happen to trees. Like, I mean, there's, there's people that go to college for a long time to <laughs> <laughs> learn that stuff. Right. And, and I think about, you know, what my perspective was and what my capacity was when I took S212. <laughs> and, I mean, and that's the other thing that, that is talked about. What if we need a whole suite of saw classes? I'm sitting here referencing S212 as if it's the only place that anybody ever learns anything about wildfire chainsaw falling operations or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Those are the highlights. Anything you want to touch on there about, about training? I mean, I think we did talk about this before that um, the... Uh, kind of the paradox there of in order to get experience, you have to train and perhaps and part of that is moving outside of your comfort zone and, you know, you know, perhaps taking on trees that you're not currently qualified to cut, but training is, uh, uh, not risk-free is the bottom line there. Yeah. And I think that that is one of the, uh, things that just like we've seen in other instances is, um, so 13% of the time the tree strike occurred during training, including two of the eight fatalities. And both of those fatalities were the trainer. In one instance, the trainer took the saw and was, was, was actually cutting and um, tree hung up, came back. That was Freeman Reservoir. And, uh, and then another instance, uh, the, the trainer was at the base of the tree and it fell, it sat back and was, you know, struck in the escape route. And, um, and then there was some other pretty radical, um, ones, um, where that didn't result in, in fatal, uh, injuries, but they were still pretty like, you know, the trainer got squashed under the tree or, you know what I mean? It's just kind of gnarly stuff. 
And what the message to me is training is a little bit more controlled to the point where if we can get an ambulance to a pack test, I bet you we could get an ambulance to an S212 field day. And that just because we've never done it that way, it seems like being over the top. But when you think about what it is that we're doing, it's a high risk activity with people that have less experience. And when there's more exposure, because, you know, you might have several students and um, the the trainers, the instructors are some of that exposure. Right. And so even if you don't have an ambulance there on hand, just have a medical plan. And you know what I mean? You, we just have to that have a medical plan is like the lesson for the wildland fire service. <laughs> <laughs> right? right. For everything. Training. Right. Initial attack. Mm-hmm. Um, all these things that we just haven't done in the past. Um, and, and especially chainsaw training, I think is one of those ones where, you know, man, maybe make a call to the, uh, local fire department, let them know where you are. Mm-hmm. Um, so that if something does happen, maybe they have a heads up. Uh, maybe some of them want to come out. Mm-hmm. Maybe they want to come check it out and see how you guys roll. And they just happen to bring their medic bag with them. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the kind of stuff I recommend. I don't, I don't have any things about changing training or all that stuff. It's just like, man, bad stuff happens. So, Mm -hmm. uh, get ready. Yeah. That's a good lesson. Um, outside the training realm, kind of looking at this analysis, these 53, um, reports and eight fatalities, what other kinds of operational kind of things might you pass on or sum up for folks? Um, a, a tactical pause after you hang up a tree, a serious tactical pause. And if you're going to do it, if you're going to be the one, set the saw down, take a drink of water. I know this isn't always th- possible. Like it might be blowing and going and the fire is breathing down your neck, but usually that's not the case. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but anyway, um, that is just that it's a, it's a whole new game. First of all, I would say consider letting somebody else do it. And if there's, you know, even if it's just you and your saw partner and you trade off just like, you'll get the saw next time. Trust me, you'll get the chance to, to get your hung up, get a hung up tree out. And, and if you are going to keep the saw, just take a drink of water, whatever, like set your mind straight, do a complete assessment, a whole new assessment. Don't be the person that I've seen. I remember the last time I was around it, I like, I literally like I had to go away because the tree got hung up and I was thinking, all right, let's go check this thing out. But the person cut and just like, just didn't miss a beat and ran in there and started. And I just, it was too much, man. And, uh, and it ended up just fine, but I was scared. So I know those are, those are the things that, um, that really stand out to me that I can, that I can say for certain, um, is the, the medical plan for, for training and, um, the tactical pause on hang up, hung up trees, the escape routes. I think, um, I, I can't say for certain what the right answer, same thing with how many people under the tree. All I would say is take a moment and think about that stuff. I think in the past I just assumed, or I, I just, it was, I was taken for granted that it's going to be 45s. I think you, there are instances where, you know, you might want to reconsider that. Um, and the same thing if, if there doesn't need to be multiple people under the tree, because anytime anyone's under the trees anywhere is exposure mm-hmm. and reduce exposure is a tactic that is a favorite of mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, uh, along those lines and tagging onto that, um, what if you're a division supervisor, uh, task force leader, following boss, whatever, and you're overseeing <clears throat> uh, a piece of ground or folks engaged in following operations? What, what you're not the person with the saw in your hands, mm-hmm. but you're overseeing, um, you know, a division, a uh, piece of dirt with, with these kinds of operations. What, what's your tip there for that, that group of folks? If you're going to give busy work, don't let the busy work involve chains. <laughs> <laughs> right. I just, yeah. I mean, it's a hard thing to do. We right. laugh about it, but yeah. you know, if you've got a crew that's on day 13, you don't want to send them home. Right. Um, so you can keep them out there. We get nervous telling people, Hey, just go up there and hide. Right. You right. know, we'd rather, we and everybody'd rather be working than not working. Right. And more often than not, working involves chainsaws. Right. But I'm just saying that's just added exposure. 
Sure. So if you're a division task force leader, just be okay with people sitting on their ass in the shade. You know, just think of it as that extra day that they're not going to get off when they go home. I don't know. <laughs> We're okay paying people not to do stuff. Go. I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't pick on aviation, but <laughs> go to the. <laughs> Go to a place where people sit around. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. yeah. Go to a place where people are standing by. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> we we are okay with paying people to stand by. Right. Yeah. You know, and tell people that um, their job is to be available. Right. Um, Number one priority. So don't engage in anything. Because right. the second you're engaged, you're no longer available. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that paradox. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, and, and so busy work and chainsaws is just exposure that, you know, I mean, if you were to talk a certain agency language, that's unnecessary risk. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if there's a legitimate reason for it, of course, you know, like if there, it's going to set up the next crew really well and all that stuff. And then, you know, yeah, it's, it's all a version of that sport falling and, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And, and then the other thing is if you're a division and you're trying to prioritize response times for the medical folks that you have, you know, the chainsaw work is, is not a bad bet. Doesn't mean that it's the place where something's going to happen, but uh, it's not a bad bet. If there's an area of your division um, or a group from your task force that is doing more saw work, um, especially falling trees. I don't know if I can even say, especially chainsaws in general like the minute you pull cord man you're in a whole nother level of risk so yeah those are my my big takeaways and then you know if i'm gonna if i'm gonna stand behind what i wrote and two more chains sawyer should wear chin straps Hmm. yeah talk about that a bit several of the reports talk about and it's not that many not enough to like have numbers about it but they talk about uh, hard hats being knocked off people's heads and the helmet works better when it stays on your head and it's just it's just a funny thing that we don't wear chin straps culturally. Other uh, professions do, right? Because it is part of the helmet, um, and we just don't. Mm-hmm. And Unless we're getting on a helicopter or taking a funny picture. That's right. You know, helicopter. That's the whole. You know, when people say you got to have a chin strap, and I remember like fighting, like why? For helicopters. That was literally the answer. Because <laughs> we have to ride in a helicopter. Oh, okay. Because it's important that your helmet stay on in a helicopter crash, but not if you get hit by a tree. Right. Yeah. You know, because it's the same thing. Like, well, why do we wear it in a helicopter? Right. Well, you don't want your hard hat coming off with the helicopter crashes. (laughs) Yeah. Arguably, we should be doing it more for the trees. Sure. You know, if you're not rocking a flight helmet, maybe just don't wear a helmet at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Uh, so, yeah, you know, um, not that I'm ever going to be the division that says, hey, I'm going to walk down the line. And if you're running a saw and not wearing your chin strap, I'm going to bust your ass. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just that's not a we're not a culture that's going to tolerate that. Thank you to Alex and Travis for recording this conversation. So did anything stand out to you? I hope you heard some lessons that you could immediately apply, whether you're running a chainsaw, around a running chainsaw, or overseeing chainsaw operations. Remember to visit our website, wildfirelessons.net, to download the tree felling accident analysis. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, We should be wearing chin straps more often from a numbers standpoint Hmm. not from a selfie standpoint (laughs) (laughs) thank you for listening to the wildfire lessons podcast be sure to subscribe share give us a review follow us on facebook twitter and instagram at wildfire lessons for more information visit wildfirelessons.net Music provided by second generation smoke jumper Steve Baker, who always likes to keep one foot in the black. Thanks, Steve. Remember, we honor through learning.